Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So today we will continue with our discussion on the introduction for tissue engineering. So yesterday I had uh, posed a few questions, I hope you had gone back and read a little bit about it. So we will start with the first question, which tissues do you think would be the easiest to engineer? So yesterday you answered with a few, did you find out why you thought those were uh, the easiest or did you have a reason for that? The growing rate, how much time okay. it takes. That is one good reason, so you, you actually, it's generally they regenerate well, so it might be easier to do. And you had mentioned skin, right? Okay. So what else? We are doing blood. Okay. So uh, somebody had also mentioned cartilage. Mm -hmm. Do you think cartilage regenerates rapidly? No. no. Then why cartilage? <coughs> So what did you identify from literature? I thought the function performed would be much simpler than something like maybe heart valves. Okay. So functionally cartilage is a simpler tissue. Yes, that is one reason uh, why you would think it is easier to emulate that. Okay. Any other tissues which you thought of? So uh, what about bones? Yeah, Bones are also reasonably easier to regenerate compared to most other tissues like uh, So uh, what do you think uh, is the common factor which you saw between all these uh, tissues? They are basically just barriers or supports, they are not functional tissues, right? So they are, uh, they can, skin is just a barrier, bone is just a supportive tissue, cartilage is also a supportive tissue, all those things are as you said the function itself is simpler compared to other more complicated tissues. So which tissues do you think would be harder to engineer? Hard, why? Because the growth rate is… Okay, regeneration is very slow, that is one uh, limitation. Functionality. The functional… The uh, cells are very highly differentiated. Okay. So uh, functionality of a heart tissue is very high, along, the, uh, along that lines can you identify other tissues? which would be even harder than a heart tissue? Nerves. Nerves and brains, okay. So brain, as of now, I don't think anybody is trying to <laughs> engineer a brain. So <laughs> people try to look at um, nerves and uh, like peripheral nervous system, nervous systems and things like that. Lungs, okay. So why? Why do you think it will be harder? I'm just asking whether, is it okay. harder? So okay. So. Yeah, so if you are talking about lung as an organ, it is very difficult uh, obviously because of the architecture and there are just too many things uh, which are changing there but uh, smaller tissues, yes it would be about the same level as a heart tissue, it would be the same level of complexity as a heart tissue. What about some, think of something which is, which has a little more uh, biological functionality. Okay, why pancreas? It is actively performing. Yeah, so uh, pancreas needs to secrete insulin and glucagon and it uh, while it senses the glucose levels, right? So it has very specific functionality. So that is going to make it a, a harder tissue to engineer. So similarly liver tissues. So liver would be another tissue where you could still have similar challenges. So these kinds of tissues which uh, actually have to respond uh, to stimuli are harder to engineer because there are some functionalities which you do not really, uh, which you cannot easily recreate in an in vitro setup, okay. So what has been the most successful clinical application that has been commercialized? First I want you to identify which are all the commercial products that you were able to find. Okay, I want to know the name of the product. Dental Okay, I want to name, know the name of the product, I want to know what, dermographed, okay. Carticel, carticel is for? 
what tissue? Cartilage. Cartilage. Dermograft is for skin. Yeah. Um, something called OP1 fatty, but I didn't know what that was. Yeah, it's, it's, what uh, is it? it's something related to the bone. OP1 putty? Yeah. Okay, I have not heard of it. So, OP... Is so it just OP number one? Yeah, OP number one. Putty, okay. Oh, okay. So, it is uh, spinal fusion uh, from Stryker. Okay. Okay. So, it basically has uh, recombinant human bone morphogenetic proteins, mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, what else? Have you seen any other uh, commercial things? So, the commercial ones kind of align with what you thought would be the easiest tissues to engineer, right? So, another major reason cartilage is actually easier to engineer is uh, it is an avascular tissue. So, you do not need to worry about uh, vasculature. Creating vasculature is one of the limitations in uh, tissue engineering. So, that can actually be overcome when you are working on avascular tissues. Okay. So, uh, we have looked at some of the commercialized ones. Actually, the most uh, established commercial product is the skin. Because the first uh, skin, uh, the tissue engineer product which was approved was a skin uh, graft. So, I think it was called Apligraph if I am right. So, or no, Integra. I don't know, there are like multiple things. So, the Integra was probably the one which was commercialized first and approved by FDA. So, uh, even with that, it is still not a full success. Uh, can you think of why it is not a full success? Sense of congestion that mm. very, very well. Okay. So, that would be one problem because uh, innervation has to happen for the sense of touch, the sensory things to have, uh, be there. That is one thing. So, uh, what else? It is not yet fully biocompatible. Okay, why do you think that is the case? Maybe due to immune reactions caused. Okay, so dermograft, uh, Ramya, you you identified dermograft, right? Do you know what it is made of? Um, no, I, I didn't. I didn't write it down. Okay, so it basically has a matrix on which cells are seeded. So it is. Uh, it's not an acellular thing. So there is already. You are going to have some. Uh, are cells from other sources which can cause immunological reactions. So, there are acellular tissues uh, as well which are used. So, uh, I think ma matriderm is probably one product where you use an acellular uh, matrix which does not have cells with it. So, but even with all that, uh, your re is one thing, your uh, sweat glands and this perspiration is one thing where and aesthetic aspects where you have to have the hair growth or the matching the skin tone of the person, all these things can be a challenge. So, because of these things, it is not a complete success. However, it has been reasonably successful to provide uh, enough of a healing effect. And another major limitation you would see with most of these things are they are ridiculously expensive. So, it is not like it can easily and readily be used by everybody uh, for general use. Okay, so, we already labeled uh, and identified a few other commercial tissue engineered products uh, and all of them have their own limitations. One major limitation is the size of the tissue engineered construct itself, which is because of the vascularization or the lack thereof, which leads to very little uh, nutrient supply or supply has to come only through diffusion and that is not the most efficient way for nutrient supply or toxin removal. So, uh, let us move on. So, currently there are different ways to engineer tissues. So, these are the, I have just segregated them, but uh, as of now people do not uh, try to do them independently, people try to pre prepare combinations. So, as I had already discussed the tissue engineering triad, it follows the same pattern. You could either use a material or cells or molecules which can trigger the regeneration of tissues. So, uh, biomaterial delivery is where you use uh, scaffolds or implants and uh, the host cells will have to migrate here, adhere to the material and uh, help in the healing process. People use uh, cell delivery as well, where you either use a transplantation of a cell population. Uh, so, the cells will basically produce their own support matrix and integrate into a host tissue. So, this is where you have the stem cell therapy and all those things where you just harvest stem cells and uh, supply it to the site of injury 
hoping it will help in the regeneration, right? So those kinds of uh, things are done uh, for cell therapy. And you also can have molecular delivery where you either use gene delivery or single molecule or multiple molecule delivery. So the uh, product which Ramya identified, uh, what is it, OP1 putty, right? So that is uh, a recombinant bone morphogenetic protein. So bone morphogenetic protein is uh, a growth factor which helps in uh, the formation of bones. So delivering such a molecule would help in regeneration of the tissue. So currently people focus on uh, combining these things. So people have seen that uh, using them independently has its own uh, advantages, but it can only help in regeneration to a certain extent. Beyond that point you need to have uh, a multifunctional material which can provide different avenues for regeneration itself. So the materials which are used uh, can be classified primarily as four things. So they are the metals, ceramics, carbons and polymers. So metals are basically titanium, uh, gold, silver and alloys. Ceramics it can be alumina, can be zirconia, hydroxyapatite, so many different ceramics are available. Uh, you have the carbons which would be carbon nanotubes, pyrolytic carbons, uh, graphenes, fullerenes, there are just too many, uh, many options where you can try to use them. So people have been trying to use these for different biomedical applications. Polymers, uh, obviously there is a wide array, whatever I have listed here is only synthetic polymers. You can also use uh, uh, natural polymers like chitosan, collagen, there are just a wide array of options which can be used. So these are the four major classes of uh, biomaterials and composite is just another <coughs> class which is basically a combination of these uh, materials which we have said. So people use polymers along with ceramics or carbons and uh, to provide different functionality. We will go into a little bit of detail of all these things and hopefully uh, we will have more discussion in the subsequent lectures. So, Metals can either be a single metal or alloy, uh, so some examples for alloys which are used in uh, biomedical application would be stainless steel or nitinol. The advantage is they are strong, uh, tough and ductile, however the disadvantage is they may corrode and they usually have a very high density. So this would mean there could be discomfort for a patient when it is being implanted in the body, so that could be a limitation. So, Metals are used as biomaterials in many cases, uh, some of the options are where you use it for structural components like hip and joint replacements, uh, bone fracture pins and plates which is used uh, during surgery. You also have dental implants where uh, metals are used. So other applications would be for uh, cardiac devices, uh, stents, wires and tubing. So what you see here, this is actually a stent. So this is how a stent looks and uh, this is used to make sure the uh, blood vessels do not collapse. So in case of uh, angioplasty that is what is done. So you actually put the stent there and uh, it helps to keep the blood vessel open. And uh, nitinol is one uh, alloy which is uh, quite popular. Uh, how many of you know what nitinol is? Does anybody know what nitinol is? Okay, so this is a super elastic material which is used in vascular stents. I hope this video plays. Okay, let's see if it plays. Okay, I really didn't want the audio. But. So that's just a water bath you are looking at. So what you have here is just a water bath, and um, the wire which they are playing with is the nitinol wire. So any kind of deformation it will again go back to its shape provided the environment is right like temperature and uh, conditions, the physiological conditions it will actually go back to its original shape. That is why it is called as a shape memory alloy. It can retain shape and elasticity. So this can be deformed for easy implantation. So you do not have to uh, open up the patient all the way if to put this in. So and it restores its original shape inside the body. So that is why uh, in angioplasty all they do is just uh, have basically a catheter which is put inside the person's body either through the wrist or uh, uh, through some blood vessels uh, between the thighs. So that is what is usually done. So it is a simple enough procedure because the material can actually be deformed and it will regain its original shape once it is implanted. 
So people are now looking at developing these stents for different applications. So recently there was an FDA approval for even bifurcation stents. So, uh, so when, uh, when, the when there is a clog in the blood vessel, a stent is placed so that the vessel can be, uh, can be kept open, right. But what can happen is these kinds of clogs can ha happen at the point of bifurcation of blood vessels. If that happens, keeping one uh, stent is not sufficient. So what people tend to do is they um, put one, cut it open and place another. It's actually a very cumbersome procedure to do that. So now recently there has been some approvals which have come out for uh, bifurcation stents. So some approvals had already been uh, obtained in European Union, but recently it was approved in FDA as well. So major problem with metallic implants is uh, effect of corrosion. So this would affect the surface and the bulk properties. It also alters the way the material interacts with the host, right? Because you are now having a different surface morphology, even the chemistry is different. So you do not know how the cells are going to react to it. So it'll, it can cause problems. So it can also cause serious volume change. So if you are going to use something like iron, and it obviously you would not use iron, you would use uh, stainless steel or something. But uh, there is going to be a significant change in density when uh, you have some corrosion. And if the density for iron is 7.8 roughly and uh, the iron oxide is close to 6, you have a significant difference in volume which you are going to have. And this will cause major discomfort for a patient. So the image you see here is actually. Uh, a new implant, uh, so it is for a hip and joint re um, replacement. So you see the one on the left side is uh, the actual new implant and the one is basically taken out from a patient after a few years. So you can see there is some amount of corrosion and this can actually be a problem, right. So that is one of the reasons metals are usually a, an issue and that is why people use very specific metals which can prevent uh, this kind of corrosion. This the image shown here is actually for titanium. So titanium is one of the more stable materials and even with that you have this kind of a problem. So ceramics are basically inorganic compounds that contain metallic and non-metallic elements for which uh, you have interatomic bonding which can either be ionic or covalent and these are generally formed at very high temperatures. So a, a glass mug, uh, a mug you use would be a ceramic, right. So uh, these are hard and brittle, so they are very hard but they break very easily. They have good thermal and uh, electrical resistance, they, they are good insulators. Uh, they are also resistant to high temperature and uh, severe environments, so ceramics are used uh, as bio in biomedical applications. Where do you think ceramics can be used widely? Which tissue would you want to use? Bones and dental tissues is where you use ceramics because that is where you have ceramics in your body. So uh, it is used again in structural components like hip and joint replacements. So you do not use the ceramic completely for joint replacements because uh, as I said they are brittle. So you would not want to place only a ceramic there. So but it is used as a coating or it is used in ways that it can help in uh, cell infiltration and so on. So uh, spinal fusion devices uh, can also be uh, ceramic materials and dental crowns uh, which are commonly used. So if you undergo something like a root canal, you would have to get a dental crown and uh, that would, you can use ceramics. You can also use metals, that is what people used to use. Now to make sure it fits with what you already have, people use ceramics. So other uh, applications would be cochlear implants, coatings on heart valves. So uh, in tissue engineering, can you name uh, any ceramic which is used? Hydroxyapatite. Okay. So why hydroxyapatite? So your bone tissue contains hydroxyapatite. So your bone actually has uh, two components. So one is uh, hydroxyapatite which is in the uh, nanoparticle size. And this uh, hydroxyapatite is actually the uh, discontinuous phase. The continuous phase is collagen. So collagen with uh, hydroxyapatite composite is what your bone is, okay. So that is why it is a nano composite. A bone is actually a nano composite material. So some of the ceramics which are used are uh, alumina, zirconia, zirconia alumina complexes. So these are bio-inert ceramics. So bio-inert ceramics would not uh, promote bone ingrowth. So you can have bio-active ceramics which are uh, 
the hydroxyapatite and tricalcium phosphate and so on which will promote uh, bone in growth. So, there are different types of calcium phosphate bioceramics, uh, hydroxyapatite is the one which has the calcium to phosphate ratio closest to the one in your bones. So, that is why hydroxyapatite is extensively studied for bone tissue engineering. So, tricalcium phosphate can also be used. So, you can actually tailor, tailor the degradation rates by using uh, different types of tricalcium phosphates. So, that is why people try to use that as well. So, people are using bioactive cements and porous scaffolds and composite scaffolds for tissue engineering. So, people also try to emulate what you see in the body, right. So, people try to use polymers along with ceramics so that you can actually create uh, bone like tissues. So, carbons are uh, basically just different types of different allotropes of carbon can be used. Pyrolytic carbon is used as a coating for uh, mechanical heart valves. Diamond like carbon is also used for uh, coating on uh, heart valves and blood contact devices because diamond like carbon has very good hemocompatibility. So, you use it for coating on uh, blood contact surfaces. So, carbon nanotubes uh, also had a lot of uh, interest in the last couple of decades probably. Uh, so, it is being used for biosensors, bone regeneration and uh, other gene and drug delivery and so on. In the recent past graphene and uh, uh, graphene based graphene uh, type compounds uh, type components are also used. So, uh, graphene, graphene oxide, reduced graphene oxide all these things are being explored. So, the image you see here is actually a TEM image of uh, reduced graphene oxide. So, this has been uh, used in uh, biosensors and also for drug delivery and uh, it has very good antibacterial property. So, it is being explored for coating on implants and so on. So, recent studies have also shown that uh, at certain concentrations these uh, graphene oxides and reduced graphene oxides can help in vascularization whereas, at higher concentrations they will inhibit uh, angiogenesis. So, you can use it at different concentration. If you use it at higher concentration, you can probably use it for treating cancers while if you use it in lower concentrations, you might be able to use it for uh, promoting angiogenesis in tissue engineering. So, obviously, most of these carbons, uh, there are a lot of detractors for it because people are worried about the long term effects. So, there are very few studies on the long term toxicities of uh, such carbons because see these are uh, nanoparticles and uh, toxic toxicology of nanoparticles itself is a major question mark which is being explored. So, this being a carbon which has not been established for a long time uh, raises serious red flags in many cases. However, the promise which these materials are showing uh, has made it an interesting material to work on and there is a lot of research which is happening in this domain. So, moving to the polymers. So, this is where uh, I work. So, I most of my uh, lab students work on polymers. We try to develop different types of polymers uh, and polymer composites for uh, various applications. Either it could be for an implant application or drug delivery application or tissue engineering application. So, here uh, which, which type of material, which polymer you use would be driven by the tissue you are trying to uh, regenerate. So, you try to design polymers in a way that it will be similar to the natural tissue itself. So, these things I am assuming you already know poly is so many, mer is the unit, polymer is basically a repeating units. So, these are non-metallic uh, components which form macromolecules, it could be chains, branch chains or cross-link networks. They have poor thermal and electrical conductivity. Uh, however, there are some uh, conducting polymers as well. Um, which have been used for uh, nerve tissue engineering and so on. So, polymers uh, are one of the most widely used uh, biomaterials because there are just too many types of polymers. There are each polymer has its own uh, properties, physical, chemical and biological properties. They are so vast. So, it has been used in all possible applications. So, valves, ducts, catheters, joint replacements, it is used in coatings, encapsulants, tissue engineering scaffolds, lenses from anything from blood bag to uh, a tissue engineered scaffold you are looking at using a polymer. Right? So, there are just a wide array of applications that you can look at 
and depending on the application you would be looking for very different properties. So, if you are going to use it as a lens, what would be the property uh, lens for your eye, what would be the property you would focus on? Yeah, transparent. And so, so, what about if it is going to be used as a blood bag? It shouldn't affect the blood inside. Okay. So, it should not trigger coagulation cascades, right? So, it, which means it should be hemocompatible, it needs to be blood compatible. So, blood should not, uh, the platelet pathways should not get activated, the platelet should not start adhering and clotting. If that happens, the blood will be unusable. So, each material has to be uniquely different and people try to engineer these materials, we try to uh, modify surfaces to provide desirable properties. So, the PMMA is used there and uh, mostly people do not use polymers by themselves, it will again be used with, uh, in right now people use it with other combinations with ceramics and so on. So, uh, polymers in tissue engineering, uh, again collagen is the gold standard because that is what is present in your body. So, you have collagen as the major component of your extracellular matrix. So, uh, people try to use collagen. However, uh, collagen can be expensive if you are going to get it as a come highly purified form. Uh, you could try to extract collagen from uh, other sources, so you can get it from any source, right? Any uh, any any tissue would contain collagen. So, if you were to take just chicken skin somewhere and you start uh, treating it, perform the proper procedure, you can actually extract collagen. However, uh, collagen is not the only material you want to use. So, people are trying to look at different things because collagen, uh, see when you talk about natural materials, you can always have batch to batch variations and there is also a risk of contamination. So, considering all those reasons, you people try to use uh, other sources. So, uh, polysaccharides are again natural sources, you also have uh, PLA, PLGA or PEG uh, and uh, so many other materials which you can use which PVA all these things are used uh, which are synthetic materials where you have very good control over the molecular weight which means the physical properties can also be controlled very well, right. So, people try to use so many different materials. And uh, these materials are also uh, fabricated differently. So, the what you see here are different fabrications. The, uh, the first one you see is probably just a uh, lyophilization and uh, freeze, freeze drying, freeze thawing technique which creates a lot of pores. And the next one you see is just a solvent casting technique where you have something like a hydrogel, a smooth surface hydrogel. And uh, the one you see after that is actually the electro spinning where you get nice fibers which could be of nano uh, diameters and uh, the other the next one is more like a printing where you get uh, or molding where you get specific structures. So, there are just many fabrication techniques, we will go into the details of the fabrication techniques when we talk about uh, the individual materials. So, <coughs> composites can be anything. Composites are basically polymers and uh, ceramics put together would be a composite. A collagen hydroxyapatite co is a composite in the bones and you can have polymers and uh, carbons combining to form conducting composites. So, people have looked at uh, putting a polymer like PCU along with uh, graphene to show whether it can improve the electrical properties. So, polymer, polymers can also be blended with metals like uh, metal nanoparticles to provide uh, antibacterial property or to deliver drugs and so on. So, that covers the aspects related to uh, materials. So, you also have uh, cells which can be delivered, right. So, that is the next part of this work. So, how do you deliver cells? So, what cells do you choose to deliver? So, again it depends on the cell source and cell types. Cells can come from different sources, it can also be of different types. So, we need to identify what cell source we want to use for a, uh, for a specific application and what would be the cell type you would want to uh, use for sp the specific applications. So, uh, the sources I have classified as autologous, allogenic and xenogenic and types I have classified them as differentiated and stem, stem cells. And just put other types of cells where you can use a cell type which is not uh, directly related to the tissue you are looking at. Okay. 
or you can look at co-culturing and so on. So let us look at these cell sources first. What do you think would be the advantage of using an autologous cell? No immune response, it is from your own body. So there is no, no chance of any immune response. Okay. Uh, what would be the disadvantage of using an autologous cell? Okay, invasive, sorry? Limited amount. Limited amount, okay. <coughs> Anything cause else? problems in the tissues you are like, like the location you are extracting. Yeah. So that is called donor site morbidity. So basically you are damaging another tissue to harvest the cells and uh, if a patient is already suffering, creating another damage to the tissue would can actually be a problem. So what about allergenic uh, transplant, allergenic cells? What would be the advantage of allergenic cells? Allergenic is from same species, uh, some other person. So, what would be the advantage? Abundance, higher availability. Abundance, okay. Sorry, higher. Higher availability. Yeah. So it's more easily available. Uh, disadvantages would be potential immune responses and rejections would be a limitation. What about xenogenic? From another species. So, much easier availability, right? So, if you are going to get tissues from uh, an animal, you are probably going to get more of it and it is much easier to uh, get animal tissues uh, compared to human tissues, right? So, uh, and ethically also it is a little uh, easier to justify doing something like that. Uh, so, what about, what about the limitations itself? Rejection. Rejection would be the major problem, right? So that is what I have here. So basically, you have uh, limitations with, uh, with all these techniques. So you need to look at uh, how you would optimize it, right? So people try to work on this, people try to develop uh, technologies so that they can expand cells. So uh, you can only harvest a certain number of cells, right? So you cannot harvest all the cells you need for creating a tissue. So you harvest some number of cells and then you grow the cells. So you provide the right environment, right nutrients so that the cells grow and th then you can use this cell population for uh, regeneration. So that is what people try to do and uh, because of this people have de developed different technologies for different types of cell uh, cells themselves and the people are working on ex improving this further. So uh, what about cell types? So I said uh, differentiated cells and uh, uh, stem cells. What do you think would be an advantage of using a differentiated cell? If it's a functional tissue which you are making, then you know that at the, the tissue that is the tissue which we are going. That is the cell which will be there. At that. Okay. So you know that the functionality is already there. Okay. So that is one advantage. This uh, tissue is already a functional tissue. What would be the disadvantage? Differentiated cells don't divide. Okay. So, they will actually be very slow in growing, so you would not be able to get enough numbers, so that can actually be a major limitation. So what about stem cells? So stem cells actually ha can be from different sources, it can be from adults, from fetuses or they can be embryonic and you also have iPSCs now. Okay. So there are different types of stem cells uh, which are available. So we will go into details of each of them later, but uh, right now what would be an advantage of using stem cells? Okay, so you can provide the functionality you want. Okay, these are abundant, much more abundant and easy to harvest, and they'll divide faster. They'll grow at a much faster rate, making it easier to culture them. What would be the disadvantage of using a stem cell? You have to provide the right factors for it to differentiate. Okay. So controlling the differentiation of stem cells can be a challenge, especially in vivo. So in vitro differentiation is one thing, but if you are going to use a stem cell and you are going to use it uh, in vivo, if you are going to implant it as a stem cell, how do you control the differentiation of the stem cells in vivo? So that becomes a different kind of a challenge. Okay. So what else? Cancer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you explain you, what you are saying is? Correct, uh, yeah. but uh, uh, like unregulated growth basically. Okay, uncontrolled growth can lead to teratoma formations, especially with respect to embryonic stem cells, that is a problem. 
So you can actually have that uh, issue where it forms into a teratoma and that can be a whole new complication you have developed now. Okay, so that is what I have here. You have um, required functionalities with differentiated cells, but stem cells uh, can give you different uh, functionality, it can, can actually be differentiated to specific functionalities, but how you differentiate them in vivo is the challenge. Okay, so uh, consider you would have to take into consideration all these things while you are uh, developing your product or uh, the problem statement. So for as far your project goes, do not just choose a stem cell because it just sounds cooler. Okay? So you would have to justify why you would want to use a stem cell for this application. If you are going to work on something, uh, make sure you have a strong reason to do this. Right? So cell therapy, there are different types of cell therapies which are done even today. So people uh, use it for local repair of tissues. So injection of exogenous cells, uh, especially chondrocytes for cartilage repair, uh, disc cells for herniated discs, stem cells uh, treatment for uh, spinal cord lesions and uh, brain lesions are all commonly done. People also look at injecting myoblasts and stem cells for treating myocardial infarction. Uh, so cells for regenerating retina and joints are all stem cell therapies have all been done. People many of some of them are experimental, some of them uh, have been reasonably established although there might not be enough of case studies or like a proper clinical study to prove its efficacy. Some of them have that but may, many of them may not. So you might just have uh, doctors taking cells and injecting it and considering that it is basically it has a lot of growth factors when you draw some blood or anything. It will have other factors which will help in regeneration anyways and people try to see that will be effective. So uh, one example would be platelet rich plasma therapy or platelet poor plasma therapy. So all they do is take the blood out and uh, spin it out to get the plasma and this plasma uh, either with platelets or uh, without platelets or like with very little platelets can be injected to damaged tissues and uh, people have seen that this helps in faster regeneration. So that is because plasma has growth factors and uh, you have uh, all the signaling molecules which will probably trigger some kind of healing mechanism. So people have shown su such things. Okay. So uh, one of the major places where cell therapy has been quite successful and has been studied reasonably well for a long period of time is uh, chondrocyte implants for uh, cartilage repair. So we will look at uh, that as an example. So uh, what you see here is uh, an articular cartilage defect. So uh, how many of you know what a cartilage is first of all? So we all say cartilage tissue, have you seen a cartilage? Like you do not think of a human cartilage, you can think of an animal yeah. cartilage which you would have seen. Yeah? Mm. So where have you seen an animal Chicken. cartilage? Chicken. Chicken. Where do you see it? Uh, the bone, it is just on the bone sir. Not yeah. On the surface of the bone. So if you uh, have eaten chicken, what you would have seen is the leg uh, piece of the chicken would have a glassy material on top. So that is the cartilage. Okay. So, so the one which is shown here is uh, a knee cartilage. So this articular cartilage uh, defect can actually be very painful. If you have a damaged cartilage, it, your walking uh, would be a painful process. So because of this, uh, the quality of life especially for elderly patients is significantly affected. This damage can also happen for uh, athletes during some injuries or if you are in an accident and so on. So age, uh, trauma, all these things can cause these kinds of damages. This is quite common. So a lot of people uh, have this. So do not confuse this with a ligament tear, ligament tear is different from a cartilage defect. A ligament is basically just a an elastic tissue which ties the bones together. So the ligament tear is different from a cartilage defect. Cartilage defect is a lot more painful. So cartilage is a neovascular aneural tissue and uh, it has uh, it does, does not heal on its own because it has very low cell density and uh, they are very low mitotic activity. There is also very little cell migration to these tissues. Because of this, this tissue does not heal on its own. So you need to provide some kind of a supportive environment for it to heal. 
So people have tried to do different things. So we will look at some of the therapies which are currently being employed and uh, how they have been established. So one term you would have seen is uh, arthroscopic debridement. So it is also called as uh, scoping the knee or arthroscopy. So people who sp follow sports would have seen this quite commonly. So many athletes go through this. So this is basically just a clean up procedure. So when your cartilage damages what you are going to have is small bits and pieces which are uh, going to be lying around. So this is going to cause more pain for the person. So this scoping the knee basically just removes the damaged cartilage and uh, cleans up the surf, uh, procedure uh, place so that it can heal in a better fashion so that there is no continued injury. So effectiveness of this kind of a procedure has been questioned uh, with respect to the, its healingness, a healing effect itself. However, it will definitely help in reducing the pain and uh, alleviating uh, the suffering of the patient. So Graham Smith is uh, one cricketer who got it done I think like 7 years back in 2011 or so. So I am pretty sure a lot of soccer players would have gone through something like this and basketball players, all these people go through uh, scoping the knee quite regularly. Another procedure is uh, mosaic plasty. So here uh, this is basically an osteochondral autograft. So what is done here is, um, so this was developed by uh, Dr. Hangadi and when you have a cartilage damage, so you take out, uh, you clean this out and you take pieces of cartilage from a non load bearing area and you use that to fill it as pegs. So if you can see this image, I do not know if it is very clear here. So uh, this is a damaged cartilage and they have actually taken small pegs from here. So and from these small pegs, they have filled the pore which is filled the damage here and you see that with the filled pegs, right. So are you able to see it? Okay. So that is uh, how uh, mosaic plasty works. You can google for more images which actually show surgical images. So this is, uh, this is a very um, simple procedure, however the problem is uh, you are now damaging uh, another part of the cartilage knowing that cartilage does not regenerate very effectively, you have now anyways created another damage. The only thing is it is in a non load bearing area compared to a load bearing area. So hopefully the pain will be lesser for the patient. So another type of surgery is a microfracture surgery. So oh, this is basically, this was developed by Dr. Stedman from Colorado and uh, here what is done is small holes are made in the base of the cartilage defect. So again for any cartilage procedure scoping would be the first thing they do, they will basically clean the cartilage. Okay. So after cleaning it they will create small holes and this punctures the surface layer of the underlying bone and this will lead to bleeding of the bone and the blood which comes out will clot and this will contain stem cells and other growth factors and this basically forms the tissue which will then help in regeneration. So this is very commonly done for uh, basketball players and uh, like American football players. I do not know soccer players are probably doing this too, not a big soccer fan so do not know. So uh, this is a very common procedure which is done. Uh, this actually is a very serious uh, surgery, the patient can take up to maybe a year for them to fully recover and uh, get back to their uh, full health. Okay. So they might be able to do regular activities after a few months, but uh, if you are an elite athlete and you want to get back to that level, it can probably take up to a year. So the problem here is that the recuperation time is quite long and also you are causing, again you are causing damage and it, it can be a very painful procedure. You are actually drilling holes on a bone and that is not really going to be an easy thing to survive. So arthroplasty is basically damaging, uh, sorry replacing damaged uh, tissue uh, either using partial or jo uh, total joint replacement and depending on how bad the situation is. Okay, so th th these are the current treatments which are done uh, and I want to look at the tissue engineering based treatments uh, from here on out. So that is a autologous chondrocyte implant. So this uh, procedure was first done in 1987. 
So it's been a little more than 30 years, but it's still considered to be experimental by many people. So even after 30 years, people still uh, are exploring this further, trying to optimize it, make it better and so on. So this was popularized by Dr. Lars Peterson. So here you need two surgeries. The first surgery, you harvest cartilage from non-weight bearing areas and then you close the patient up, you start uh, take the cells, culture the cells in vitro. Once you get enough uh, cells, then you go for the second surgery, maybe a couple of weeks down the line and you clean the damaged area now and you place a collagen uh, membrane on the defect and inject the cultured cells. The cells will now be present there and they will help in regeneration. Chondrocytes can actually secrete uh, the ma matrix they need to culture, they need to grow on. So the idea is uh, have these chondrocytes there and hopefully they will secrete the matrix and they will heal the tissue. So there have been three generations of this. Uh, the first generation is where which I just explained. So all you do is. Uh, uh, take a chondrocyte suspension which is uh, and you inject it under a periosteal flap. So this is a small flap which is sutured on top of the damage and you take out uh, chondro chondrocytes which have actually been cultured and this is now injected uh, inside it. This is just the flap is just to make sure the cells do not uh, leak out of the place. It will hold the cells there and hopefully this will uh, help in regeneration. And uh, this was uh, the next generation where a chondrocyte suspension is injected under a collagen membrane instead of using a, a flap which is again harvested from your own body. So here a collagen membrane was used and this has actually been reasonably effective. So recently what people have been doing is they actually culture the chondrocytes uh, on the scaffold on a uh, collagen scaffold and then place it uh, in the damaged tissue. So this has also been quite effective. So this has been, this is now identified as the third generation of uh, autologous chondrocyte implants, okay. So uh, this basically gives a summary of what are all the different cell based techniques and biomaterial based techniques which are being used. So we will discuss a little bit about um, molecule based techniques, uh, signaling based techniques which are currently available. So signaling molecules are usually not used by themselves So the, because these are uh, growth factors or proteins which need to be delivered to the site. So they are usually loaded to some material and delivered. So we will look at what are commercially available and what is currently being done in that domain and uh, with that we will come to the conclusion of uh, the basic introduction for tissue engineering, okay. Thank you.